live from ESPN, a friend of the show and a class act, Jeff Carlo of ESPN. Jeff, welcome again, my friend. Hey, good to be back, Anthony. How are you? I'm good and pleasure to have you on, Jeff. We really appreciate your time. Jeff, before we talk about the game, let's talk about the tournament itself, Canada, and what you experienced, what you really enjoyed, and what you'd really like to see for the next Women's World Cup really uh, take after what Vancouver and all of Canada did. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I thought Canada did a, a, a great job as host. Um, yeah, I mean... I knew that people were going to be friendly going in, and uh, you know certainly they everyone that I encountered lived up to that reputation. Um, you know, I'd say you know that most of the the venues that I encountered were great. Um, you know, I didn't get have the chance to go to Moncton. I think that was the only one that I missed out on. But um, you know, I, I thought the stadiums were all in great shape, and uh, certainly uh, loved Vancouver. Um, you know, had a chance to to spend. Uh, yeah, I had two stints there, you know, one for the U.S. Nigeria game and then one for the final, obviously. And uh, but I had good experiences everywhere I went. Um, you know, it's 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 always refreshing to you know when you have to go abroad to just feel like you can settle into a country and 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 just really kind of get immersed in everything. And, and Canada, I think, welcomed everyone with, with open arms, as it were. And uh, you know, it was just it, it made it easier to be on a road on the road for. Uh, you know, for an entire month, and uh, it was really enjoyable. So in regards to hospitality, Jeff, transportation, uh, all those things that are real important for people like you in the business and also fans, what grade would you give Canada in this World Cup? Yeah, i give it, uh, you know, B plus, A minus. I mean, uh, yeah, there's always going to be a few hiccups. Um, you know, certainly, you know, everyone remembers the, the long line in Moncton, you know, where, where fans were having a hard time to, to get into the stadium, I think, you know, at least, maybe the first game, you know, the first couple games that were there. But, um, you know, it was really easy to get around. I mean, just in terms of flights, in terms of, of you know, car travel and everything, um, you know, hospitality. I mean, I had great meals there. And, uh, you know, it was just uh, overall it, it was fairly easy to, to get done the things that I needed to get done. So, uh, you know, <laughs> no trip is ever going to be perfect. But uh, I think Canada got an awful lot right. Let's discuss the big issue that was taking place months before the World Cup even uh, kicked off, and that was the turf issue, the turf gate as we like to call it up here. You didn't hear much about it throughout the tournament, but what you did hear was a few little complaints here and there. But overall, what were your thoughts, honestly, Jeff, after you watched the number of games in this Women's World Cup? Did you really feel that it took away a lot of the, you know, the ability, the talent of different countries, of different players that really would have been shown on grass? Yeah, I think it did take something away. I mean, you know, I can't remember, you know, I can't recall how many through balls I saw just kind of run away from players. You know, and that's just, you know, that's completely a function of uh, of being on turf. I mean, it's, the, you know, the ball just doesn't slow down as quickly as it does on grass. And, you know, I, I think, you know, for some countries, that really can't be an excuse. I mean, you know, here in the U.S., you know, tons of turf fields. I know the U.S. team was training on turf for months, you know, prior to the tournament. So, uh, you know, in many ways, you know, it's up to them to adapt, and, and certainly you, you would think that they had enough time to do that. But, uh, you know, I, I think it did impact things. And, and certainly, you know, the, the wear and tear that it takes on players and, and the, the temperatures, the on-field temperatures, you know, where it was you know, upwards of 140 degrees, you know, if you put that, put that thermometer, you know, down on the field, I mean, that's, that's not ideal. And, um, you know, certainly uh, something to think about going forward. And I, you know, obviously in four years, the, the next Women's World Cup is going to be in France, and uh, I, I can't imagine it not being on grass. But, um, you know, I, I'm sure that we'll, we'll see some other, you know, competitions on turf, and hopefully, uh, you know, people will gather the data and, you know, the companies will gather the data and, and try to figure out a way to make it better going forward. Fifteen minutes in, we both knew, all of us knew, I think, uh, worldwide that this game was over uh, already. The dismantling uh, was taking place, USA over Japan. Uh, Carly Lloyd, I think it was that third goal, uh, was unbelievable. She had the game of a lifetime. Uh, talk about that first 15 minutes, that tidal wave, that roller coaster that really bamboozled Japan and they didn't know what hit them. It was stunning. Um, you know, and, you know, obviously, you know, people don't like the, to make comparisons between the men's game and the women's game, but it, it did remind me of the, of the Germany-Brazil semifinal, you know, a year ago, where, you know, as a journalist, it seemed like every time I picked my head up, another goal was being scored. It, it was just stunning um, how, 
the U.S. was just able to, to almost bully Japan, you know, in, into submission. Um, but I, it wasn't just brute force. I mean, you, you looked at the, the, that first corner kick, and it, it was some clever movement and, and some real strategy that was involved. You know, just the amount of space that, you know, the U.S. players were able to create for Carly Lloyd to be wide open. You know, I, I think that, that showed just how much the, the U.S. coaching staff did its homework and, and uh, you know, kind of the – they use their brains as well as brawn, you know, to get that four nothing lead, you know, for the U.S. And uh, you know that that last goal by Carly Lloyd, I mean, just wow. I mean, that's <laughs> that's just something that you dream about, and to be able to pull that off in a World Cup final, uh, it, it speaks to how much confidence Carly Lloyd was playing with by that point in the tournament, and and the whole team too. Uh, you know, this was a U.S. team that got stronger and stronger, and. You always hear about peaking at the right time. That that's not as easy to pull off, I think, as people think. But the U.S. made it look easy, and, and certainly they were deserving winners on the day. Fifty thousand plus fans in BC Place in Vancouver. Uh, it's safe to say, Jeff, that at least I would say, for my money, there had to be at least forty-five, maybe forty-six thousand U.S. fans. They made the trek up there. It was unbelievable to see all the colors of the U.S. of A. It made it like a home game. And to me, I think that that was a real key to this World Cup being so close uh, to the U.S. of A. that really had a lot of fans coming up, unlike the last World Cup, where Japan had some more support than in this one. Yeah, I think in, in Germany, you know, there are a lot more neutrals, you know, were, were supporting Japan, you know, in that final. And, and Japan had knocked out Germany, so I think there was a sense that, you know, Germany wanted to, if they were going to lose, they wanted to lose to the eventual champion. And you know, that certainly was not the case here in this World Cup. I mean, you know, about the only game I can remember where the U.S. just didn't have a dominant home field advantage was, um, you know, was, was a game against Columbia, I think, that was in Edmonton. Um, you know, that was, uh, you know, there was 19,000 fans there. And, you know, obviously Edmonton's a, a little bit, you know, tougher to get to, um, you know, just in turn, you know, you can't really just drive across the border and, and all of a sudden you find yourself in Edmonton. I mean, obviously it, it takes a little bit more to get there and uh you know perhaps people were saving their money up for later in the knockout rounds as well but every other game i can remember it was just a an overwhelming presence of american fans and you know the players talked about it you know how it was really you know giving them a boost you know especially you know in the early part of the tournament when things weren't necessarily going completely the u.s team's way you know i, I think that did to provide some uh an emotional kick and uh you know it certainly it was a big help to the u.s team Jeff, what have we learned about this World Cup? I know what I've learned, that other countries are starting to catch up. England and Colombia, to me, were really, really impressive. We learned also that more and more nations are starting to take uh, the sport seriously in the women's area. France, to me, looks like a real, real contender in the next World Cup. What did you learn from this World Cup? Well, I learned that you know, there's, a, there's a lot of reason for optimism surrounding the women's game. But, you know, for me it's always tempered with, you know, you know, are these countries willing to take the next step? Um, you know, people say, well, you know, Team X did well, so now they're going to get more money. I mean, another way of looking at it is, well, you know, if you're from you know, a confederation or a federation, you're saying, well, you know, with minimal investment, we were able to achieve this, so why should we give them more? Um, you know, because the thinking is that, you know, perhaps they can't really compete, you know, with the Germanys and the Japans and, and the United States team. So, you know, you hope that, you know, especially a country like Cameroon, um, you know, I, I, if, I, if I recall correctly, they, they really looked out of their depth at the Olympics. And, and this time, you know, they were very, very competitive and, and deservedly made it, made it into the knockout stages. And you hope that they get more investment. You hope that more support is provided. But, um, you know, I, I – this is a slow and steady process. I, I don't think this is something that's going to happen overnight. Um, you know, certainly, you look at the investment France has made, you know, with their academies and, and really providing opportunities for girls and young women, uh, you know, on par, you know, using facilities that the men use. I mean, you, you hope you see more of that, and you hope that other countries see the benefit of it and, and uh, you know, how, how much success can be achieved by, by making that investment in, in, in time and money. Jeff, just before we let you go, I really appreciate your time. I'd like you to explain in best that you can Title IX. And a lot of people aren't aware of this and how important I think it is for the women and Team USA and the success they've had. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, Title IX was a, a piece of legislation that was passed by Congress you know, in the early 1970s. 
and it basically said that you know any educational you know institution that received public money had to provide equal opportunity for girls and young women as as well as, as boys and young men and so that really required uh, a lot of investment and one way of, of kind of achieving that goal was through sports uh, you know if, if you're going to spend X dollars on uh, on men's sports and you know you got to do the same for women and so I, I think what we, we what, an, what an outgrowth of that was was uh, you saw more and more investment in women's sports um, it became not only <laughs> It not only was a legislative requirement, but it, I think it, it changed the culture here in the United States about you know opportunities for for girls and young women. And so, you saw that increased investment in sports. It became ingrained in the culture, and I really do think that that it gave the United States, certainly in, in soccer terms, a, a significant head start on the rest of the world. And uh, you know, not, so now the rest of the world is trying to play catch up. And, and some countries are. I mean, you see, you know, you talked about France earlier. Uh, they're definitely a country that has, has made huge strides, and, and you're seeing it in, in, in certain places in South America. Colombia really impressed me this time around. But, uh, you know, Title IX really did give the United States a huge advantage, uh, not only monetarily, but, but culturally. And, uh, you know, that's one reason why the, the U.S. team is where it is. Jeff, really appreciate you taking time. We know that you're tired. We know that you've done a lot of work and more work ahead with the Gold Cup coming up. So we really appreciate it. Keep up the great work. And a lot of people, when we have you on, send us emails, texts, and tweets how they really enjoy your analysis, whether it's the women's or men's game or MLS. So, again, we thank you so much. And, again, safe travels throughout the Gold Cup as well, Jeff. Hey, Anthony, anytime, man. Really appreciate it. Class act, Jeff Carlo of ESPN. Love having him on. I consider him a friend of the show what a, a wonderful guy he is. He really knows his stuff, and he covers now the Gold Cup 2015 starting in a matter of 24 hours. Canada will be playing tomorrow night, Wednesday, and we'll talk about that throughout the week, this Gold Cup, and what it is in store for Canada, USA, Mexico, on and on. This is a real good test for Benito Floro and Team Canada. Jurgen Klinsmann and his team right now are really firing on all cylinders. We saw that win in Germany against the World Cup champions, also against the Netherlands. Jurgen Klinsmann and his staff have done some real good things with the new leadership, in my mind anyway, of TFC duo Michael Bradley and Josie Altador. USA should be considered a finalist and possibly the Gold Cup winner of 2015. But the ball is round, so anything can happen just like it did when Holger's heroes, Holger Osiak and Team Canada won it way back a number of years ago, and they did it with a 1-0 victory, and it was an unbelievable time in Canada's soccer history, about the only bright spot that has taken place uh, next to getting to the World Cup in Mexico. We will take